The street names of modern Paris reflect some of the most eminent French mathematicians of the 18th and 19th centuries. In the cemetery of Père Lachaise, overlooking the city, one of the most influential, though little known, mathematicians is buried. Here, Gaspar Monge was laid to rest in 1818 by his former students from the École Polytechnique. As he was in political disgrace at the time of his death, his admirers risked persecution by erecting this monument to his work. In his time, Gaspard Monge was the foremost teacher of geometry in France. He was a founder of one of its greatest educational institutions, the École Polytechnique. The work of Monge and his colleagues laid the foundations both mathematically and institutionally for some of the greatest advances in 19th century mathematics. We start our story in the French Revolution. With the vanishing of royal power in France, new styles of government were established in the 1790s. Old economic and social institutions were abolished. A new spirit was abroad. Despite terror and chaos, Scientists and mathematicians did what they could to lend their talents to the new republic. The revolution would lead to the end of the prestigious Royal Academy of Sciences, based in the Louvre, to be replaced by a new organization, the Institute of France. In those revolutionary years, everything seemed possible. A number of grand schemes for reform were proposed, including a scheme for reforming weights and measures so that they would be standard across the country, and preferably internationally. A commission was set up, and to it were appointed the leading mathematicians of the country, Morge, Lagrange, Laplace, Legendre, all people we'll hear more of later. And here, in the library of the Institute of France, is preserved one of the most remarkable products of those revolutionary years the great 19-volume set of trigonometrical and logarithmic tables to decimal divisions set up by the Commission and carried out by an engineer, Gaspard de Prony. So here, for example, in this volume of sign tables, we can see how the right angle was divided into 10,000 parts. For example, 0 0.0303 of a right angle in the new division is what corresponded to 2 degrees 43 minutes 37.2 seconds in the ancient division. And its sign is 0 0.04757 and so on for 29 decimal places, an unprecedented degree of accuracy. So how were these results achieved? This mammoth task was carried out by the idea of division of labour which de Prony got from the Scottish political economist Adam Smith. Smith's The Wealth of Nations contains a description of how a pin-making factory works, and de Prony applied this to the production of these tables. He set up three teams. The top team, headed by the mathematician Legendre as factory manager, so to speak, drew up the analytical formulae on which the rest were calculated. The second team, who were less highly trained, converted these formulae into numbers, which were then passed to the third team, who were virtually untrained people and only had to add and subtract according to instructions they were given, and enter the results in these tables. To check the calculations, de Prony had two sets of teams working on the tables. The set of tables produced by one team is here, 
The set produced by the other team is a couple of miles away at the Paris Observatory. On the first page of these sign tables, we have a note giving instructions for the printing of the tables. It says that when they are printed, the proofs have to be checked against both sets of tables. But when de Prony finally completed his tables, they were considered too expensive to print. But they remained here in the Institute of France, available for consultation. And the division of the right angle into decimal parts was passed into law in 1799, along with the other components of the decimal system. The reform of weights and measures was but one concern of the new revolutionary state. The whole of the educational system was undergoing a major reconstruction. Successive governments planned to set up a series of primary, secondary and higher schools for the people of France. But to implement this, a large number of trained teachers was required. It was to this building in the Botanical Gardens of Paris that trainee teachers were assembled in haste from every region of France. This amphitheatre was the lecture hall of what became known in 1795 as the École Normale. In this room, the standards, the norms for the French educational system were to be set. Mathematics was a very important part of the curriculum. And here, the country's leading mathematicians came to lecture. Laplace and Lagrange came here to teach how to teach elementary mathematics. Laplace, the country's great applied mathematician. Lagrange, the great pure mathematician, who had been headhunted, as it were, from Berlin to come to Paris before the revolution. You have seen how the second, third, and fourth degree equations can be solved. The fifth degree presents a sort of barrier which the analyst's efforts have not yet broken through. And the general resolution of equations is one of the things in algebra which still remain to be cleared up. Lagrange, the leading mathematician not only of France but of all Europe, was here lecturing to some 1,200 students, ranging from extreme youth to old age, and in ability from virtual innumeracy to the talents of the young Joseph Fourier, who was to become a distinguished mathematical physicist. Joseph Fourier, who was the ablest of all the École Normale students, wrote an account at the time in which he described his experiences. Lagrange has a strong Italian accent. Everyone knows that he's an extraordinary person, but one needs to have seen him to recognize him as a great one. Some of what he says excites ridicule. The other day he said, there are a lot of important things to be said on this subject, but I shall not say them. From the transcripts of the lectures, which were all copied down and printed, we can tell that the Granges must have been well above the head of most of his pupils. Gaspard Monge also taught here. He drew on his 30 years' experience of teaching military engineers and lectured on a subject he had virtually invented called descriptive geometry. The purpose of this art is to represent exactly on drawings which have only two dimensions, objects which have three. It's needed by the engineer who conceives of a plan, by those who must see that it's carried out, and finally by the workers who must execute the various parts. Not only is it suitable for training the intellectual faculties of a great people and for making a contribution to the perfecting of the human race, it is also indispensable for all those workmen whose aim is to give bodies certain definite forms. But Morge's lectures too must have seemed very theoretical to those who were to go and teach children in the furthest reaches of France. 
The École Normale turned out to be a very expensive enterprise, however. And after four months, the school closed and the trainee teachers were all sent home. But those lectures had sown the seed for a new idea in French education, that of getting the greatest scientists and mathematicians to train the new generation. But even before the students of the École Normale were sent home, Gaspard Monge was planning a higher level school. The idea was to create a single national school for the training of civil and military engineers. In contrast to the École Normale, the planning for this new organization, which was to become the École Polytechnique, was meticulous. Someone who has been particularly concerned with the early history of the École Polytechnique is Professor Jean Dombre. Education was in turmoil during the revolution in France and many projects were being thought of. A lobby of scientists acted in order to create the École Polytechnique within the framework of the revolutionary government. Monge was an enthusiastic member of this group. He modeled the new school according to the patterns of the military schools where he had been a professor previously. But the new patterns were different in the sense that they were systematic. The school was located in Paris so that it centralized all the able students from all over France. Among those professors, 